Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Ghostbusters Afterlife, directed by Jason Reitman, son of Ivan Reitman, who directed the films in 84 and 89, the latter of which young Jason actually cameoed in. You know, my dad says you guys are full of crap. Jason? Well, some gosh. people have trouble believing in the paranormal. No, he just says you guys are full of crap and that's why you went out of business. Of course, being a nod to his dad. As this new whole film is on a macro level, a tribute to absent papas, spoilers ahead, manifested in this film in 70% opacity by the likeness of the late Harold Ramis, Egon Spangler, reconnecting with his descendants and his fellow busters. The reason this final reveal hits so hard is all the subtle ways afterlife is rooted in Ghostbusters inside jokes, production design, and mythos. So let's go through this movie scene by scene to break down all of these overlooked details because, well, Bustin makes me feel so good. The film opens with familiar music composed by Rob Simonson, who actually said he deliberately aimed to evoke the eerie score of Elmer Bernstein from the 1984 film. Simonson's Trapped track features spooky piano notes, chimes, and synth. just like Bernstein's music in the opening library scene. Little touches like these just stoke that nostalgia for the original like a nice warm chocolate bar blanket. In Somerville, Oklahoma, fuchsia clouds swirl over a peak beyond the old Shandor Mining Company. Just like the clouds of 550 Central Park West in the 84 film, as Gozer arrived. Now, Shandor was the name mentioned by Egon in that film, who explained that building's whole history. The architect's name was Evo Shandor. I found it in Tobin's spirit guide. And then in 1920, he started a secret society. And he wasn't alone. He had close to a no. thousand followers when he died. They conducted rituals up on the roof, bizarre rituals intended to bring about the end of the world. And now it looks like it may actually happen. And they talked about how that building had selenium girders, which were chosen as conductors of spiritual turbulence, selenium that was mined here in Oklahoma, where it is later implied ancient worshipers of the Sumerian deity Gozer built a hellmouth ages before the United States even existed, and why Egon returned here to try to trap Gozer, which he does here using one of the terror dogs as bait but his trap field generators short circuit. By the way, in that clip, the Tobin spirit guide that Egon mentions is the same book that the kids later read to learn all of this history. Now, in this opening scene, we never fully see Egon's face, only his silhouette with a curl of white hair over his forehead, much like Egon's look in the animated series. But no dialogue is spoken, just pure visual storytelling, which makes this opening scene more frightening than one would expect, especially when Egon's chair grabs him, a callback to the demon chair arms that grab Dana in the 84 film. The reason he is in this chair is that he is guarding the trap that he hid in the floorboards beneath the chair and his PKE meter, psychokinetic energy meter, lights up to mark this spot and to signal that Egon's ghostly presence remains in this house with unfinished business. Egon's daughter Callie, Carrie Coon, and his grandkids Trevor, Finn Wolfhard of Stranger Things, and Phoebe, McKenna Grace, are forced to move out of their city apartment to Somerville. Phoebe wears the same round glasses that Egon wears, which this film later underlines by having her literally put on Egon's glasses directly over her own, and they drive past the diner Spinners, where the light is out on the word shakes, ironically, most likely caused by the shakes the town is experiencing from these supernatural tremors. Egon painted on the sheet metal of the gate of his farm, Revelation 612, and the words of that Bible passage. That's actually the corrected version of when Ray and Winston talked about Revelation 712 in the 84 film. I remember Revelation 712, and I looked as he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became as black as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood, and the seas boiled, and the skies fell. Inside the house is a super high stack of books, of course a callback to the library in the 84 film. You're right, no human being would stack books like this. There's also a statue of one of the terror dogs, which in that movie did take the form of gargoyle statues. Now, all over the walls of this house are numbers. Finding these same numbers in the Gozer Temple, these kids later deduce that these are actually dates of historical freak occurrences. 1883, 1883, the eruption of the volcano Krakatoa. 1908, 1908, the Tuskuga blast in which a mysterious meteor air blast flattened a forest in Siberia. Ray actually mentioned this same event in the 84 film. 
You have been a participant in the biggest interdimensional cross rip since the Tunguska Blast of 1909. Yes, Ray said 1909, but it really was 1908. 1945, they say what didn't happen, but was likely referencing the atomic bombs dropped on Japan. 1984, Gozer's arrival in New York. And now 2021, Gozer's return. But this movie was originally going to release in 2020, so they must have had to VFX change this to 2021. Annie Potts returns as Janine Melnitz, who says of Egon, Your father wasn't much of a homemaker. He could hardly keep the power on. Literally, that is how Egon died. His electrical generators failed, cutting off power to his trap field. Janine is also a bit vague about how close she was to Egon, and not to their flirty relationship in the first film. Egon's ghost connects with Phoebe using a chess set initially, a nod to the real Ghostbusters animated series in which Egon loves chess but never has anyone to play with. Also in the comics, Egon faces death in a game of chess. Meanwhile, Trevor uncovers the Ecto-1 car in the barn. Later in this car's glove box, they find a Twinkie, of course a reference to Egon's Twinkie line in the 84 film. Let's say this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the New York area. According to this morning sample, it would be a Twinkie 35 feet long, weighing approximately 600 pounds. <coughs> That's a big Twinkie. At summer school, Mr. Gary Gruberson, Paul Rudd, has the kids watch the 1983 film Cujo, based on the Stephen King novel about the killer dog, of course foreshadowing the terror dog that will chase Gruberson later on. Callie meets with the town shopkeeper Jack, who's played by Tracy Letts, Carrie Coon's real-life husband, and an amazing character actor in his own right. On the town cinema marquee are the movies Bingo and Cannibal Girls. Cannibal Girls was a 1973 horror comedy film directed by Ivan Reitman, and this film also showed up on the movie theater marquee in Ghostbusters 2. Phoebe finds finds Ego's hidden trap and brings it to school, where now the horror film Child's Play is playing, and she researches the old Ghostbusters commercial from the 80s film on YouTube. If you look over on the right, some recommended videos on the sidebar include 10 Signs of Government is run by Shandorians, meaning the conspiracy theorists of this world believe the Gozer cult has taken over the government. Maybe it has. Then where are the Ghostbusters now? With it looks like present day images of Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray in that thumbnail. Proton Acceleration with Megan Amram. Megan Amram is a comedy writer on shows like Parks and Rec in The Good Place, and Savage Science of the Proton Pack with Adam Savage from Mythbusters, and a thumbnail that looks like it's from his Tested video on YouTube. Trevor and Lucky hang out at the top of the mine shaft and hear a voice from below that croaks the name Gozer. Gozer's spiritual form in this movie was played by Canadian dancer Emma Portner and voiced by Iranian-American actress Shorey Agdashlu, while her physical corporeal form was actually an uncredited cameo by Olivia Wilde. Phoebe follows the PKE meter to Egon's underground workshop, accessible by Sly Sliding down a fire pole, just like the Ghostbusters had in their converted firehouse office. Among his collections are petri dishes, a reference to the hobby Egon told Janine about. I collect spores, molds, and fungus. There's also a door sign reading, Made I Need Room Service. That was on the door of Bankman's office in the 1984 film. From here on, Egon's ghost possesses the lamp where he is able to literally illuminate knowledge for his descendants to finish his unfinished business. And Phoebe finds her grandfather's Ghostbusters jumpsuit. And in the pocket are his glasses that, of course, match her own, and a crunch bar wrapper. A callback to the candy Bankman gave Egon. You, you've earned it. Also on the desk is a replica of Egon's dirt farm and house, evoking the town miniatures that we saw in the attic in Beetlejuice, and of course the town square replica Doc Brown built in Back to the Future. But here we learn that the property's reputation as a dirt farm was in fact its literal function and intent. No plants grew there because traps were buried in the dirt. It was designed to be a graveyard resting place for the ghost gozer. Phoebe and podcast test the proton pack. Switch me on. Switch me on is exactly what Ray says to Egon in the elevator. Switch me on. Here, I just love the extreme close-ups of all the elements of the pack and Phoebe's little struggle as she pulls the gun out of its holster. Meanwhile, Podcast dramatically draws his microphone as his signature weapon. Nothing's deadlier than the spoken word. Podcast wears Ray's goggles. He's very much the Ray of this crew, down to ending the movie more cover than the rest in Marshmallow Goo, and adorably connecting with Ray over his podcast that found its voice in the 46th episode. Now, this would normally be when I interrupt the video to push you to like buy socks or cutlery or mobile games, but good news, I'm not gonna do that this time. Instead, 
Instead, I'm just gonna ask you a huge favor to support something that really can make a difference in this world, something that means a lot to me. Because New Rockstars recently partnered with a really, really great nonprofit based in Gainesville, Florida, where most of our team met in college. Like, no joke, New Rockstars would not exist without that Gainesville community. So we want to give back, and we hope you will too. Community Spring is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to dismantling structural poverty and spurring economic mobility at a grassroots level. Level. They focus on providing income to meet people's needs and providing power to reshape the systems that keep them down. And this week, New Rockstars is gonna be matching all donations that you make to Community Spring. We believe in their work so much that Philip and some members of the New Rockstars team recently went to Gainesville to work hands-on with Community Spring. We shared some of what we've learned about storytelling and content creation with them and Philip set them up with their very own blue dungeon so that they can make their own video content. Damn. And we're gonna keep visiting and working with them in 2022. We truly believe that the great work that they are doing in this community can be its own spring that flows outward and cultivates growth and opportunities and change across the country and the world. So many viewers reached out to us the last time I talked about Community Spring and they were really thrilled with all the support the New Rockstars community showed them. And now is such a great time of the year to be thankful for what you have and look to help some folks that could really use it. We really hope that you will join us in donating to Community Spring and show them how awesome our viewers are. So click the link in this video's description to learn more about Community Spring and please donate. Because again, New Rockstars will match all donations made to them this week. So jump on this right away and we appreciate your support. Thank you! They follow a trail of ectoplasm to find the ghost Muncher. Of course, this movie's version of Slimer, in this case, actually voiced by Josh Gad. Jason Reitman said that they wanted to restore the Slimer character from what he turned into, which was the Dalmatian of the Firehouse, essentially, back to the angry, scary dude that he was supposed to be originally, which is why Muncher now has multiple limbs and burps metal chunks at them like machine gun fire. Podcast says, Free floating metal muncher. Definitely class five. Calling back Ray's description of Slimer. Sir, what you had there was what we refer to as a focused, non-terminal repeating phantasm or a class five full roaming vapor. Real nasty one too. Class five refers to the CDI classification system that goes up to class seven for malevolent demonic entities that are probably gonna kill you. But class five are the lower, mid-level, less dangerous, but non-humanoid forms. Their chase and capture of Muncher is awesome, and it mirrors the original Ghostbuster chasing Slimer, in that it causes a ton of damage, but does end up with the team's first official trap. Muncher even kind of anoints this moment by spraying the Ecto-1 with a fire hydrant that clears the dirt off the Ghostbusters logo, reflecting how this team is dusting off the Ghostbusters legacy, and Muncher was really the key to that renewal, the way Slimer was the key to their first break. But they get arrested by the Sheriff Domingo, like his dad, played by Bokeem Woodbine. Also that front desk cop, Deputy Medjuk, is played by Stella Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd, Aykroyd's daughter. The sheriff references, of course, the tagline of the original films by offering the kids their one phone call. Who are you gonna call? Who are you gonna call? And Phoebe does actually call a Ghostbuster. Dan Aykroyd himself returning in his race stance in his occult bookshop from Ghostbusters 2 down to the red desk phone. On his arm is tattooed the Revelations passage, chapter and verse. He mentions having been in the slammer himself, calling back when they were jailed in the first movie. And he says their firehouse office is now a Starbucks. And that Winston went into finance. Bankman teaches at SUNY. Meanwhile, Gruberson picks up ice cream at Walmart. Best Baskin Robbins, a nod to Paul Rudd's MCU role as Ant-Man Scott Lang, who of course worked at Baskin Robbins, and I'm sure the company is well aware of this product placement. Baskin Robbins always finds out. And he freaks out watching the Stay Puffed Marshmallows coming back to life, but instead of in giant form, in miniature form. Because we did actually see Dana buy a bag of these things earlier in that movie. These things are freaking hilarious. The first one, before it bites his finger, face plants onto the shelf, and it leaves these adorable little circular imprints on his belly. A few others, you can see rolling a can away, some others riding around on a Roomba actually run one over. They impale each other with umbrella skewers. One shoves candy in the other's mouth and you can see him kind of cringe like he's not sure if he likes it. Some of them roast themselves on a barbecue grill and one gives a thumbs up like the T-800. They melt a bar of chocolate on one who loves it like he's in a warm weighted blanket. And then one jumps in a blender and turns himself into goo, but still smiles. The terror dog Vins Clortho, the Keymaster, 
chases Gruberson out of the Walmart, a chase very similar to Lewis Tully's run in the 84 film, down to the stop motion movement of the dog as it stumbles crashing into stuff. The kids have to release Muncher from the trap to get their gear back out of impound, and the Ecto-1 drifts around the corner, as it does when it speeds out of the firehouse in the first movie, and of course it drives past a mural of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man in the town. Back in the mine, the kids witness Gozer's rise, and the corpse of Evo Shandor resurrects, played by J.K. Simmons, who doesn't get very long in the movie because Gozer rips him in half. Meanwhile, Callie finds Egon's photo wall of her as a kid in the workshop, and she gets possessed by the gatekeeper, Zul, just like Dana in the 84 film. She even says, there is no mom, only Zul. A callback to Dana's line. There is no Dana, only Zul. She also wears a similar golden dress that Sigourney Weaver wore, and the gatekeeper and keymaster bang in this movie as they do before. Chaos erupts throughout Somerville. There's an old-timey ghost in a miner hat who probably worked in the Shandor mine. He was designed to be a throwback to the taxi driver ghost in the 84 film. There's also an eye popper ghost modeled after the real Ghostbusters action figure. When the kids strategize, podcast straps on the colander helmet that Lewis Tully wore, the Aura video analyzer. The Gozerian altar bears the same triangular pyramid stair step architecture from the 84 film. Phoebe distracts Gozer with her nerdy jokes as Podcast uses the RC car trap to snatch the gatekeeper spirit. They drive past the Spinner's Diner, but the light-up sign now just reads Sinners as the evil spirits have overtaken this town. And back at the dirt farm, the generators short circuit again, but they are saved by the arrivals of the original living Ghostbusters suited up. Ray Stance, Dan Aykroyd, Peter Venkman, Bill Murray, and Winston Zidemore, Ernie Hudson. When Gozer asks if they're gods, Venkman says, come on, Ray. And Ray finally says, says yes, a callback to his mistake in the 84 film. Are you a god? No. Then die. If someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. They refer to Gozer as flat top, as they did before, and immediately cross the streams this time. But ultimately, it falls to Phoebe, who gets an assist from the ghost of her grandfather, Egon, with the resurrected spectral form of the late Harold Ramis. But rather than the actor's actual appearance in his later years, they instead feature an aged up form of his angular face from the 80s films, meaning that they had to use archive footage of Ramis from those movies as a mask, which they could then animate on its own with additional layers of aging. This design choice was made according to Ramis his daughter who gave her blessing and said Jason Reitman wanted to make sure it was the character of Egon and not Ramus himself. And they really pull it off, largely by having Egon never actually speak, which they set up in the no dialogue opening, because that is where past VFX resurrections you may have seen in other movies of deceased actors often get stuck in that uh, uncomfortable, uncanny valley. Really, bringing back Ramus as a ghost was actually how Bill Murray wanted Bankman to return in the third Ghostbusters movie. Egon also became a ghost in the real Ghostbusters animated show at one point, and then in one one of my favorite shots in the movie, Egon's ghost lines up with his fellow Ghostbusters. They all turn and smile at him. Ray apologizes for not believing him. Bankman just gives him a knowing smile. In real life, Bill Murray reportedly made up with Harold Ramis after a years long feud between them that started on the set of Groundhog Day. But right before Ramis passed away in 2014, Murray showed up to his place with a box of donuts to make amends. I don't know if this moment was a direct homage to that. I just like to imagine that might've been running through Murray's mind. And Egon dissipates and floats up into the heavens as the kids watch in awe mirroring the final heartbreaking moments of E.T., which the composer said he even tried to evoke with the score. And the words for Harold appear on the screen as we return to the opening shot of New York City from the 1984 Ghostbusters film with, of course, Ray Parker Jr.'s theme song. Now, there are two post credit scenes in this movie. First, Sigourney Weaver returns as Dana, running that same psychic shock therapy test on Bankman with the cards that he used on the male and female test subjects in the first film. Bankman fesses up that he always just shocked the guy. And then after the credits, we briefly see a deleted scene from the 80s film in which Janine gave Spence her lucky coin from the World's Fair in 1964, and then we cut to Janine holding the second coin that she said she had at home as she meets with Winston, who reveals he has been financing Ray's occult bookshop, and he welcomes the Ecto-1 back into the dusty old firehouse as a red light blinks on the red containment unit, leaving the door open for future installments. With a title like Afterlife, this film truly was the more optimistic take on death that Reitman's Ghostbusters has always embraced. A true life after supposed death in a tribute to a franchise that has meant so much to so many. Support New Rockstars by checking out our merch options at newrockstarsmerch.com. Follow me at EA Voss, follow New Rockstars, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis and breakdowns of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs>